Hello, my name is Warren Meyer. I am a writer at climateskeptic.com. And the following is a presentation I made to the Regional Council of Rural Counties of California uh, on September 25, 2008 at South Lake Tahoe, California. It's called Don't Panic, a Critique of Catastrophic Man-Made Global Warming Theory. In this presentation today, we will discuss five topics. First, we'll ask if the world's been warming over the last 100 years or so. We'll discuss whether that warming is due to man's CO2 or perhaps other causes. We'll look at future man-made warming and try to decide if it will be substantial. We'll look at potential catastrophic effects of warming and ask whether or not we're seeing the leading edge of some of those effects. And finally, we'll look at CO2 abatement programs like AB32 and try to decide if they make sense. But first, is the world warming? Well, over the last 100 years, the answer is almost definitely yes. The world has warmed about six-tenths of a degree Celsius. Everything you see in this presentation will be in Celsius. You can see from this chart, which is stitched together from two data sources, uh, most of the longer history is from the Hadley Center in England. It has one of the longest surface temperature data records. And the newer data in the lighter blue is actually from satellite temperature measurement we've had over the last 30 years and is superior in a couple ways and why I use it for the newer data. But you can see that temperatures have been increasing and this is why folks are perhaps worried that there's a global warming issue because you can see a steady increase since the beginning of the century. However, there's a couple interesting things that, that may mitigate against the message this chart is initially telling us. The first thing is that if you look at the last 10 years, there really isn't a trend. You see that global temperatures are actually quite flat, which is surprising because if you go in right now and Google a term such as global warming accelerating, you're going to find over 1.2 million results of articles and media stories and websites that all have headlines that say that global warming is in fact accelerating, it's out of control, it's rising three times faster than expected, it's, it's ahead of forecast. But in fact, through the last 10 years, it's impossible to see how, how one could come to the conclusion that it's accelerating or ahead of forecast because, in fact, what we see, and you can see the data right here, is a quite flat trend. The other thing that mitigates, perhaps, against the past historical temperature rise being quite so scary is the fact that there are biases in the surface temperature measurement record. We talked about why we use satellites when we can in the last 30 years. That's because surface temperature measurement stations can be biased by the surrounding countryside, and in fact, they're particularly biased in city areas. This was a study done a couple years ago in California, though it's been repeated in a, a number of other places. He took all the major surface temperature measurement stations in California, and on this chart put a green or a blue dot if they've been getting colder or have been about the same over the last 50 years, and put a red dot if they've been getting warmer over the last 50 years. And you can see that there's a very clear distribution of the red and green and blue dots. The red dots tend to hover around the cities like Los Angeles, San Diego, Bakersfield, Sacramento, and the green dots tend to be out in the countryside. That's because the temperature measurement stations in urban areas are affected by what's called the urban heat island. The urban heat island bias means that the concrete and the asphalt and all the machinery and buildings in a city tend to absorb heat during the day which makes the daytime temperatures slightly hotter, but makes the nighttime temperatures much hotter as all these concrete and asphalt and buildings re-radiate the heat uh, through the evening and keep the night times warmer. That's why if you live in a city, you'll see that the forecast is almost always for, say, 58 degrees tonight in the city and 52 in the outlying areas. The outlying areas are usually much cooler. In fact, my son and I did this as one of his science projects back in eighth grade. We put a electronic thermometer up on the roof and drove across town and actually measured the change in temperature and found that the outlying areas of Phoenix were nearly 10 degrees cooler the night we tested than the inner parts of Phoenix. These problems aren't just isolated to cities. Uh, Anthony Watt over at surfacestations.org has a national effort of volunteers to actually document the conditions of surface temperature measurement stations. This is one near to where I'm making the presentation here at Tahoe City, California. And you can see that the white box there is, is the temperature measurement station. And it's surrounded, even though this is categorized as a rural station, it's surrounded by condominiums and a tennis court and a parking lot. And there's cars with hot engines parked right next to it. And the actual most classic thing is five feet away from it, you see that black barrel. That's a trash burn barrel where, where trash is burned three or four days a week right next to the uh, thermometer that measures that we're trying to measure global warming with. So there are problems with the surface temperature measurement station, which may exaggerate some of the past warming.
So if we come back to our original question, is the world warming? I, I still think the answer is almost undoubtedly yes. We've seen a warming trend even in the last 30 years from satellite measurement where there's not these urban biases. But the historic record is likely overstated. And remember, we haven't seen any real warming trend over the last 10 years. Okay, given this past warming, how much of that's been due to manned CO2? Well, the answer is really we don't know, no matter what anybody tells you, because the climate is extraordinarily complex. And to isolate one factor as causing changes in the climate is virtually impossible. After all, nobody has a thermometer that reads one temperature with CO2 and one temperature without CO2. And in fact, the problem is made harder by something that, that really isn't communicated well very often in the press, is that the change in CO2, the change in atmospheric composition over the last 100 years due to man, has been about 100 parts per million CO2. Just to give you an idea of what that is, because most people don't think in terms of parts per million, that means that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased by 0 0.01 or one hundredth of a percent over the last hundred years. That's an extraordinarily small change in composition. So how do we figure out how, or come to a hypothesis even, that CO2 might be causing this temperature change we've seen over the last 50 to 100 years? Well, there's been a couple of approaches, and I'm going to take you through each of those and show you uh, what they said and the problems that have been found in them. The first one was from ice core analysis. And you probably saw this if you saw an inconvenient truth. Al Gore had one of those really cool charts that went across five screens. Um, I wish I was at, were able to make a presentation uh, on such a setup. It was really neat. But what he showed was basically this chart, which is an ice core analysis. Let me tell you how they do it. What they do is in the places like Antarctica and Greenland, the ice is actually laid down in layers, almost like tree rings. And if you bore through that ice, you can actually bore back into history. And what they do is they take these ice cores and they can go back down through all those layers, count the layers, figure out what year they're looking at, and test the ice. And from the different qualities of the ice, they can actually infer what the world's climate and temperature uh, may have been at the time that that ice was laid down. And that's how they came up with this chart. And the one thing you can see from it is that it's, there's just an incredibly clear relationship between CO2 and world temperature. When CO2 is up, temperature goes up. When CO2 is down, temperature is down. And Al Gore really used this as the Rosetta Stone in his movie. And for a long time, back in the early parts of this decade, I was convinced by this chart that CO2 was a substantial driver of temperatures in the climate. But it turns out there's a problem in this chart, and one of the interesting things is it's pretty clear Al Gore knew this problem when he presented it, because he didn't actually say the words, you can see that CO2 is driving temperature increases. What he said was, you can see that the relation is complex, but they always sort of move together. Well, why wasn't he more definitive with this if this is really such a, 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 a fabulous analysis? Well, it turns out that as if you looked deeper in the analysis, we've gotten better at doing those ice cores, and we've gotten better at cutting the, the, the strata finer and finer in those ice cores and measuring more carefully. We found something out that, yes, these two charts are moving together, but in fact, each of those upward temperature increases occur 800 to 2,000 years before the CO2 increase. So when you kind of really magnify in that scale movements that seem simultaneous, in fact, the temperature is rising first, the CO2 is rising afterwards. Well, that really hurts your causality argument because it's hard to say that a CO2 increase is causing a temperature rise if the temperature rise occurs 2,000 years before the CO2 starts going up. And in fact, what we now suspect to be going on here is that oceans hold a lot of the world's CO2. And as the atmosphere warms, for whatever reason, the sun changes or the climate changes for some natural reason, as the world warms, the oceans give off some of their CO2 and actually increase the concentration in the atmosphere. And the opposite happens when temperatures fall. So in fact, what we see from this chart is actually temperatures driving CO2 levels and not the opposite. So it turns out this isn't the Rosetta Stone, the, the key analysis that it was originally thought to be. And so scientists have had to go look elsewhere for definitive proof that CO2 is, and man CO2 in particular, is causing recent temperature increases.